If you're looking for more horror outside of the mainstream, look no further than Unsung Horrors, a podcast about underseen horror movies. I'm Lance. And I'm Erica. Every other week, we'll cover a horror movie with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. We'll even give you double feature recommendations to pair with the movies we discuss. From gothic to shot on video, from slashers to comedies, from giallo to J-horror, we'll cover all the subgenres. So join us as we unearth these hidden gems of horror. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at Unsung Horrors, available wherever you listen to podcasts. And part of the Someone's Favorite Productions podcast network. Hello there, and welcome back to the Disc Connected. I'm here with Curtis Spieler, who is a restoration artist for Vinegar Syndrome. Love that title. Curtis, thanks for doing this with me. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. I uh, got a lot to cover, of course, but um, first, for anybody that's watching, I'm sure one of the big things that they want to know is uh, working for a boutique that many of us love and uh, adore. How did you get started with Vinegar Syndrome? Uh, well, so Vinegar Syndrome is in Connecticut, which is where I was born and raised. And um, that's got to help. Yeah, that <laughs> does help a lot. Um, there's, there's no there's no easy way to get into this type of industry, right. to be honest. Um, I apologize, that, by the way, if you hear a fire truck go by, because our building is literally located right between a police department and a fire station. So uh, <laughs> there's always stuff going by. Um, but uh, I, I lived in Connecticut and uh, we, uh, I, I knew one of the uh, uh, Brandon Upson, who's one of the restoration artists here. I knew him prior to this and uh, I just, you know, reached out to the company one time uh, and was like, Hey, listen, I'm a filmmaker in Connecticut. If you guys ever need any help with anything, let me know. And they had me do a couple of uh, special features and uh, you know, recording some interviews and stuff like that. And just over time, they offered me a job here and I took it and it's uh, six years later and I'm still here. So, so somebody that is a restoration artist, what do you, what are you working on on a film when you get one of these in? Well, uh, so basically for people who don't know the process, um, when we acquire the rights to a film, we try to hunt down the best um, source possible, which would be the original camera negative. And if we can get our hands on that, uh, we bring it in, we scan it, and we have a digital output that's then created. Then we go through and we clean up the dirt and the dust and the scratches and any issues like that. That's the simple version of what we do. It gets a <laughs> little, it gets a lot more complicated, especially if uh, people are familiar with the types of films that we put out. They're yeah. not always taken the best care of. Um, we definitely get uh, into the down and dirty when it comes to the films that we work on. And uh, so sometimes we have to find multiple sources. Things are damaged. We have to like piece things back together. Um, you know, you might have, uh, you know, the original camera negative, but it could be missing a reel. And then we've got to hunt down that reel from another surviving yeah. source. So it can get very interesting um but basically the the short version is yes we go through and we do like a digital cleanup of the film and try to get it back to what it would have looked like when it showed at a movie theater back in the 70s 80s whenever it was uh, originally made there is only a handful of years that you've been at vinegar syndrome so far and in that time the stuff that we've seen released is there a title that comes to mind that you go yeah that one was a goddamn nightmare <laughs> Oh man. Um, yes. Uh, there's a few of them. Uh, uh, thriller, a cruel picture. That mm. was, uh, that was a particularly difficult one. And, uh, sorry, uh, we are, <laughs> we are a working company. So there's people coming in the office. Um, yeah, Thriller was a particularly difficult one. Uh, luckily, we were able to get back to the original camera negative. Um, it just was, you know, kind of dirty, took a lot of work. Um, yeah. Beastmaster was another one. That was one of our first UHDs, and uh, we weren't able to get the original camera negative. We had the inner positive, which is basically a level down. Um, right. But a lot of the studio pictures, that's all they keep. It's hard to get back to the original negative. Uh, so that being one of our early um, uh, UHDs, that took a lot of work. So uh, those two are the first that come to mind. Oh, and uh, A Blade in the Dark. 
Um, for anybody who's seen that, we released that last year for our Halfway to Black Friday sale. That one was particularly difficult for me. Um, I also do some sound restoration, and I'm usually the one who's kind of responsible for piecing things back together if there's problems and all that. And not to get into it too much, but the there was a lot of sound issues with uh, Blade in the Dark because there were multiple cuts that were made. There was like a TV yeah. cut versus the uh, theatrical cut. And the sound sources didn't match, and it took a lot of work to get that to where it is. And, uh, yeah, those are kind of the three that come to mind. <laughs> I, I like that you bring up a Blade in the Dark. Uh, funny enough, I – gosh, I think it was about – three months before vinegar syndrome announced their uhd that i i was going to appear on somebody else's show and we were going to talk about a blade in the dark and i'd not seen it yet so i went to go seek out where to find it and of course it's on shitty tubi so i got to watch it on tubi and it was the old like really awful scan of it that did nothing to you know excite anybody about the colors or what was happening in the movie and it was just a bad experience with the restoration and this is the perfect example of a movie that i thought was pretty ho-hum like barely even average, but watching an upgraded restoration of it, that movie changes dramatically. And uh, yeah, the, the work that you guys did on that was astonishing. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of hard work went into that. Well, and it, it's, I'm glad you bring that up because I've noticed that myself films that sometimes you see a, a like garbage version of it that was put out and you're like, okay, whatever, it was fine. And then you right. see a new restoration and it kind of gives you a whole new appreciation of the film. Yeah. And uh, that's happened to me working here. I'm like, Oh, we're putting that out. Eh, it's okay. You know? And then I work on it and I see the restoration. I see the final product and, I'm, and you start to appreciate things like the cinematography or the lighting or things that you just didn't appreciate the first time around. So yep. thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, again, it's not meant as the uh, kiss ass or anything. It's really, to highlight the, the amount of work that goes into some of these things and with uh with those three that you mentioned specifically they are uhd all three of them and for many people that are in this hobby right now is a rough time when you start talking about 4k because everybody out there is either complaining that a title is not 4k saying they're not going to buy something until it is 4k or something else and i love that you brought all three of these up is your work one of the things that goes in but behind deciding if you do 4k or not uh i mean the big thing that usually determines whether or not we do a 4k is if we have the original camera negative we have done uhds from interpositives that like i said uh which is the next generation down but we try to get the original camera negative um i think it kind of comes down to a couple of things uh has it been released? Are there like uh, multiple versions of the Blu-ray already out yep. there? Is it something that could really benefit from a UHD? Uh, you know, the, the color, uh, one of the things with UHDs for people that don't know is it has more color space so you can get a better contrast, better color, things of that nature. So if there's something that with, has really good cinematography, um, good lighting, things like that, that might encourage us to do a UHD. But there's a number of things that kind of go into that decision. Sometimes that's more of the higher ups that decide kind of what is going to be a UHD and what's not. But, um, you know, for the most part, it's really do we think we can improve on either the versions that have been put out or right. does this film just kind of warrant one? And honestly, as we move forward, it's starting to just become the, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say like the main version of films, uh, the main right. source, but you know, it's it, as the technology is progressing, people are getting more used to UHD. So, you know, will it replace Blu-ray? I can't say for sure, but you know, this, it's like when the DVD transition happened with Blu-rays, yeah. you know, it was kind of a, a boutique thing to have a Blu-ray and now, you know, everybody has Blu-ray. So, you know, we'll see what the future holds and what uh, technology offers us as we move forward. Yeah, and, and the big thing is uh, people need to level expectations because uh, not every boutique has has the resources of Vinegar Syndrome either. And, man, UHD is expensive to put out. That's one of the other big things. It is a lot of work. It, it requires more restoration. It requires more time. Um, it requires uh, more encoding. Um there's just and then uh the qc the qc process when we go through and we spot check or yeah. not spot check but we watch the whole films to make sure there are no issues um in the encoding or anything like that it's it's a bigger more complicated process that just puts in really a lot more man hours than anything else and you know time is money and that's you know for any business so uh it, you know we have to weigh the cost factor uh when it comes into that part of it 
that's a big part of it. And one thing that uh, most of your, uh, we'll, we'll say, uh, legacy with Vinegar Syndrome so far is probably wrapped up in uh, New York Ninja. Would you say that's the case? Uh, yeah, that was a big thing for me, definitely. I, uh, uh, I'm, you want to get into it? We can kind of talk about it. We do. I mean, I, I, I know that you are all over the discs, and so I don't want to rehash the same thing for everybody, because obviously it's like one of the most, not to, again, not to like kiss ass to you, but one of the most important, uh, in my opinion, at least projects the last handful of years. This, the Lost Picture Show from VS last year, probably something like the Black Emanuel box set from Severn. Those are, those are some of the more like, how the fuck did we pull this off type of things. But the big thing could you share for everybody before I start asking some questions, what New York Ninja is if they happen to have not seen it yet? Sure. So uh, basically New York Ninja was a movie that was originally shot in 1984 and for production and budgetary issues, the movie was never finished and was subsequently abandoned. Um, I start working for vinegar syndrome and I find out that in our film archive, we have all the original unedited camera rolls for New York Ninja. So that's just, you know, unedited picture basically the only problem was uh, all the sound elements were missing so we had unedited picture for an unfinished movie and no sound and small problem <laughs> it is a small problem so i uh, talked to the owners here they were trying to figure out if there was anything we could do with it and uh myself being a filmmaker i decided if i, I would approach them and asked them if they would be willing to let me finish it and if they'd give me a budget to let me kind of piece this thing together and see what I could do with it. And they agreed. And so basically over about a two year process, I worked on piecing the film together, creating a coherent story out of the footage that was there. Um, I wrote new dialogue. We brought in some of our favorite genre actors to dub the voices and a band called Voyager three, uh, who was an amazing band did, uh, an original score. And basically we were able to finish this movie that, uh, was abandoned 30 five years prior so um watched it again this week uh showed my wife this time and uh wore, wore the shirt in celebration uh, thank you uh i i've got so much from it this this project has been uh something since i very first heard about it just inspiring to hear the amount of passion that somebody can have for something like this and my love for archiving things and re restoring things and all that has it, it it's amazing to see something like this realized like it's one thing to dream about it but to see somebody be given the budget and actually pull it off and now it's playing in theaters and stuff like that that is so rare first off so congratulations i know i've not been able to speak to you in person ever before this but that's such a big deal but you are all over these discs so i don't want to go too much into detail i want to tell everybody if you've never bought it go buy new york ninja support it love it live it i, I don't know what else to say about that but the big thing there's not much documented on your response to it. So I, I'd love to hear, like, how, how do you feel? How do you feel about the rollout and how everybody's responded to this film? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been interesting as a uh, as like I said, I'm a I've made a couple of low budget films prior to this. And yeah. it, it's interesting because you 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 expect you hope that your projects get out there and they get seen and, you know, you get to have like, you know, some kind of notoriety off of them. Uh, this is weird to have it happen for a movie that's kind of not mine. <laughs> you right. know, like it is and it, it isn't. So um, but it's 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 really interesting because um, I know that there's some people out there who don't realize what went into making the movie. Um, I, I've read reviews and people who just have stumbled across it and watched it didn't realize that all the restoration that went into it. And it's oddly kind of a compliment because, I mean, what we tried to do is really uh try to make it as authentic as possible to the period that it right. would have been released. And, uh, you know, working on these movies here at vinegar syndrome, I, I like to think I have a pretty good idea of, of the style of films, uh, that were made at that time. So I really just tried to make something that would like live up to what would have been released at the time. And I think I achieved that. So in a weird way, when people don't know what went into it, that's kind <laughs> of like a big compliment. Um, yeah. You know, like not knowing that I was involved is, you know, but at the same time too, it's kind of hit this like cult status right away. And, um, I think a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers like strive for that and, uh, to, to kind of have it to be part of a cult film is, is kind of cool. And, you know, it's almost like I went back in time and made a movie that got released now and is getting yeah. the kind of love. So yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. The, the cool thing is there, there are so many projects that, uh, you know, we've seen, 
I hate to use the word fail, but we've seen fail over the years that people try to make a, a cult film that they're they're not doing something in earnest in respect right. to the filmmaking. And this could have easily just been like an impossible project to make come out and feel earnest. And yet every single scene does. And all of the voice acting is on point. And honestly, I think one of the biggest things that holds it all together is Voyager 3's score. Like the score on this film is astounding. Yeah. Yeah. They went, they went above and beyond. I can't give them enough credit. And I have to also give credit to, there's a company called three beep um, yep. out of New York. They helped a lot with uh, the voiceovers and the dubbing and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, it's hard to get it to be, you know, period accurate. Um, and it, you know, something like this, there's a lot of humor for the people who haven't seen it. There's a yeah. lot of humor kind of baked into it, but I didn't really go out of my way to add any humor. Um, you know, we've all watched these movies here that uh, movies like Samurai Cop or like Miami Connection or something like that, where it's like somebody went to go kind of make a serious project. And um, but it has this like kind of can't be fun vibe to it. And, you know, we can all enjoy it and laugh and have a good time with it. And, you know, that's the type of film that this is. But I didn't want to add any more humor than kind of what was there. There was, you know, some choices that I made here and there to kind of amp things up i'm like you know when i'm in the edit i'm like okay should i do it like this or do it like this right. it might be a little bit funnier if it's like this and so I, you know i would keep that but i didn't go out of my way to make jokes or to do like a you know uh to write dialogue that would be too jokey or like a you know like a mystery science kind of yeah. thing i didn't i didn't want to do that we wanted to just pay as much respect to the that era of filmmaking as possible so and you bring up one of the things that I found most fascinating on the disc, actually, is the scenes that were not in your edit and your commentary on why they weren't in the edit. And I think it is much more uh, like Frank than we hear from most directors, primarily because it wasn't your film. And so it's not like you were, man, when I shot this, we were super proud of this day. It's more of like, yeah, th this didn't work. So there was no reason to include it. And for anybody that's interested in the process behind it, I heartily recommend it. And it's, it's, I think it was like 25 minutes long or something like that. But that featurette, I, I felt like was maybe the most important piece on that entire disc. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, as like, as an editor, you know, I kind of fell into editing in the sense that I wanted to more or less be a filmmaker, but right. when you're working on a budget, you tend to write your own stuff. You tend to direct it and then you tend to edit it. And I do think anybody who's out there listening, who wants to get into the film business as a director, you should know how to edit. I think it's very important. It helps teach you what to kind of shoot. You learn what works and what doesn't, but when you're on a low budget film, you don't have time to go back and do reshoots and all that. So when you get into the editing room and you find out there's problems, you have to figure out how to fix them yourself. And yep. so all that training, all the mistakes that I made on my film helped me to fix the mistakes that were made on this film, because that's one of the reasons it was never finished. It was kind of a mess. Um, but, you know, having to make the choice as an editor to cut stuff that I've shot myself you know, you, you have to be willing to do that. And so, you know, yeah. that, that training, I think kind of helped when it came to New York Ninja, because I could look at it objectively and say, okay, that's just not going to work. This has run too long. And, you know, there were debates here as well too. Um, the beach fight, for example, uh, you know, for anybody who's seen the outtakes, there's a, or the deleted scenes, there's a beach fight and uh, a couple people, the original cut had that one in there. Some of the stuff just didn't even make the original cut, but that was originally in there. And uh, when I decided to cut that, there was some debate here in the building about it. And people were like, no, 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 keep the, keep that. And I'm like, it doesn't advance anything it slows everything down and you know so sometimes you just have to make those hard choices but at least you have the special features so that people can see them and you have written and edited some of your own things before this how how does the the process compare like was, do you feel like this was a more difficult undertaking uh it was because i've never done anything like it and really yeah. there's no roadmap for it because very few people have done anything like this <laughs> so uh i just had to 
kind of trust my instincts and and make decisions that I thought would benefit the project. Again, it, it you know one of the great things is being here at Vinegar Syndrome. I mean, we are literally surrounded by these films every day. I mean, day in and day out, we're working on this stuff. So it's like it just kind of becomes ingrained in you. And so you know you see little things uh, that were done in certain movies, like um, like in New York Ninja, where it ends in the freeze frame. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> standard stuff. But like when you're watching these movies and you see them do something you're like oh yeah that i gotta do that i can use that to fix this you know you start to find little things like that so um i mean really it's just kind of a love letter to the to the genre and uh you know i just kind of went with my instincts and i you know seems like it works so same with all the voice casting obviously a love letter to lots of genre films uh Big fan of Michael Berryman in this house. Uh, he is he is incredible. I thought he was maybe my, my favorite standout from uh, New York Ninja. Uh, for anybody that uh, is miraculously both watching this interview in the future and has the wonderful happenstance to do what you just did for New York Ninja, what what would you have done differently? Looking back on this process, what what would you tell somebody else to maybe do different? Um, I don't know. That's that's a tough call. Um, I mean, now that I understand how the dubbing process works more, um, I think I might have uh, been able to tighten that up slightly. Um, right. I tr- I tried to match what was it? The hard part was we were dubbing English over English, which you don't normally see. It's usually a foreign film. But yeah, um, if anybody who knows their genre films, like you take like a maybe like a, a Italian film, like a giallo or something, there might be a mix of different types of actors in there. There might be American actors, Italian actors, German actors, and they're all speaking their own language. And then it all gets dubbed at the end of the day. So I've seen English dubbed over English before. And so I actually kind of used like the European films as an inspiration more than like Hong Kong or martial arts films. Um, but I think, I think knowing the process of how this works a little bit more, I probably could have tightened that up a little bit. I watch it now and I'm like, ah, I could have done that a little bit differently. Um, so probably the dubbing just cause, uh, it, it was all new to me at the time. So, well, and the other big thing that is a big part of the disc too, is not only is this all brand new to you, but then you're entering COVID too. So that's gotta be a huge wrench into everything. (laughs) It was, it, it hit at like kind of the wrong time, like it did for everybody. But, um, in a weird way though, there were some benefits, uh, because, uh, a lot of studios became really good at remote recording. Yeah. So, uh, like sound studios, music studios, they all became good at, uh, remote recording. And so it actually helped us maybe cast some people that we wouldn't have been able to normally, um, all the voice, all the main voices, we tried to cast, uh, actors that were in, other movies that vinegar syndrome put out so we kind of limited ourselves right away uh you know who was even alive or who (laughs) has been in the movies that we've put out so uh we we limited ourselves right off the bat and so to to find the right people who fit the parts was difficult but um at that time everybody was kind of spread out and so we had people in canada we had people in florida we had people in los angeles we had people in las vegas and we were able to just uh talk to studios out in those places uh book the actor to come in do the uh remote recording so i would be here in connecticut three beep was in new york the actor would be wherever let's say las vegas and we were all tied in together and we're able to do it and that's kind Kind of how it's done a lot now um my wife actually works for a recording studio and that's how it's all done now like it's rare that the director even comes in anymore um because they're just they find whoever's closest to the actor and then everybody right. remote links in so um so in, in that sense it kind of helped um but yeah it was you know at the time when COVID hit it like just hit the brakes on the project and i was like oh man i had already been working like a year on it you know but I mean, a lot of people went through similar things, so, you know, right. we, we all made it through. Uh, funny enough, the way the timing is working out on my my channel and everything, I'm planning on releasing this on John Liu's 80th birthday, just uh-huh. to, as a bit of a little remembrance and honor to him, because this is, this is such a, a crazy thing, and I... I know that he's out there somewhere still alive. I, I, I wish that he had had at least a, a little feeling on, uh, on uh, this. It'd be, I'd love to hear what he thought about this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, as far as we know, he's in Vietnam um, and we tried to get in touch with him, but it just didn't work out. So uh, to my knowledge, he doesn't really want anything to do with his uh, 
prior film career. So it just kind of is what it is, you know? Yeah. I had that with another project recently. There's, there's so many people. I just, I would love to know why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I got in contact with you is I was talking to, uh, Oscar Besher and, uh, he said, you know, you really should talk to Curtis cause he touches every single thing that leaves the vinegar syndrome office. So, I mean, lately th- th- there's so many titles that are just kind of off the wall choices and it's vinegar syndrome. So that's always been the case, but um, what, what are some of the ones recently that you feel like uh, a personal connection to with what you've worked on? on oh, man. I mean, there are definitely some films that I've like dug in deep on uh, more so than others. Like I-, I know I already mentioned blade in the dark, but I, you know, I'm pretty proud of the work that went yeah. into that one. So I feel definitely like a, a personal connection to that. I mean, sometimes it's just the movies themselves. Um, we've we've already announced it's not out yet but we already announced for our halfway to black friday sale that we're um doing uh navy seals and uh you know for me it that was that was a nostalgia piece for me i grew up in that time period and uh i grew up on action movies and horror movies and so like a film like that was was very much i was i was very excited when we got that one and so it's it's nice when you have something that you you know, remember as a kid watching and then all of a sudden you're here working on it and restoring yeah. it. So there's definitely those uh, personal connections, but there's just some movies like um, one of the ones when people always ask me, like, what are some of the, you know, my favorite movies that Vinegar Syndrome put out? Um, there's a movie called uh, Sudden Fury that I am a huge fan of that I feel like does not get a lot of love here. And yeah. that was early in my uh, career here at vinegar syndrome. That was one of the early ones that I restored. And, uh, that's when I knew, like, I loved this job because all of a sudden I'm working on this movie that I had never heard of. And, uh, not a lot of people know what it is and we're working on it and I'm watching it and discovering it. And at the end of the day, I was like, Oh my God, this movie is amazing. And it's like (laughs) one of my, you know, top films that I just, I really, really love it. And I'm like, it's so cool to be working at a company where that can happen, where, you know, you're discovering movies as you're working on them. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, all the lost picture stuff. I mean, nobody had ever really seen that. So we're constantly discovering new films here, uh, as you know, employees that work here. Um, but sudden fury is one of those ones that just stands out for me. Um, because it just really hit me when, when I was working on that one. Uh, since this is coming out uh, May 20th, which is the week that the Halfway to Black Friday sale is going to be starting, um, Navy Seals, you brought it up. What, could you could you try to sell somebody on that that's maybe never seen it? Uh, if if you are like an 80s action fan and you have never seen Navy Seals, you have to just <laughs> stop what you're doing right now and just go watch the movie. I mean, uh, is a, you know, it was at Charlie Sheen's like peak where he was just in everything. Um, but uh, Michael Bean. If you've seen Aliens and you've seen Terminator, you know who Michael Bean is. He's yeah. awesome in it. Uh, it's just, it, for me, it's just, again, it's a nostalgia piece. Uh, you know, it's it's just a fun action movie, and it kind of, like, ticks all the right boxes. Uh, so if you're a fan of that kind of stuff, definitely do yourself a favor and check out Navy SEALs. The restoration work, um, I, I would love to hear about how, how you learn to do that process. Because obviously, for a lot of us, it is... Uh, not something that you come across in like uh, random everyday life. So how, like, how, how was your training? What was your education like on this? I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. I mean, there really, at least to my knowledge, there's not a lot of actual training out there for right. restoration. Maybe there is now, now that, uh, you know, there are more film schools and things like that. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I didn't have any experience. The, what I had experience in was film. Um, that was one of sort of the requirements when I started working here. Yes, I had done my own, uh, independent films. Most of them were digital. However, when I went to film school all those years ago, we were still shooting film. (laughs) Um, so I did have a knowledge of film and like, you know, understanding film and, you know, even the simple difference between what 35 millimeter film versus 16 millimeter film is, is 
knowledge that not a lot of people have these days. So uh, any kind of film knowledge goes a long way. The rest of it was sort of on the job training. I mean, it's learning to work with the programs. Um, Luckily, I had obviously already a background in editing, which helped a lot for this. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of what I do is sort of fixing things. So I'm I'm in Premiere working on things, not just in our restoration software. Um, So really, it was having like a, a background in editing went a long way for me um but again as far as the actual restoration unless you have the software yourself it's you have to kind of learn on the job uh with editing being such an important part of that answer i would love to hear because uh obviously great editing should be fairly like unnoticeable you shouldn't really be able to pay attention to it that much but for somebody learning editing you feel like every single thing that you edit is the most jarring change in the world. And it's just trash at first. What, what has inspired you? Like what type of editing is something that makes you say, this is what I yearn for. Like, were there certain movies that were important to you for editing? Cause that's, that's not something we talk about very much. No, it's, it's not, you know, editing is one of those tough things that, you know, you can take classes on it, but I I don't know if you can really teach it. You know, you can, you can teach, little techniques and like okay here's like here's what you want to do you want to cut on the action or you want to do this or you don't want to put these two shots next to each other but the rest of it i i really do feel like it's it's kind of like a uh just a feeling i think you kind of know when things work and when they don't i you know i look back at some of my older stuff and i'm like "Eh, that wasn't i the you know the editing could be a little bit tighter but i i really think it's one of those things the more you do it the more you just your brain learns what works and and what doesn't um you know it's a it's kind of like writing in that sense like yeah. you can learn the the techniques for writing but if you don't have the ability to s- sit there and like creatively write something you know write believable dialogue or whatever it is um I, I don't know if you can really teach it so um i would say to anybody out there who is an inspiring editor just keep editing watch movies watch and see what works and what doesn't work because that's the thing is most people when you're watching a movie like you said you don't notice the editing so you have to actually stop yourself and (laughs) actually watch the editing and actually sometimes you're surprised with what they get away with there's edits i've seen in movies that i would have never made that edit but when i saw it (laughs) it it glanced over me and then i went back and watched it i was like wow they did that i was like i don't know if i would have done that but it worked so um do you remember a couple of those offhand uh no not not <laughs> offhand but uh I, there was something there was like um an action movie or something uh it might have been like um one of the born movies or something because you know they're shot sort of chaotically yeah and uh oh actually this, this wasn't me noticing it this was i was watching a youtube video and they were uh they were pointing out the different fighting styles and uh there was something that like i noticed in the edit that i was like oh my god i would never would have done that like the way the camera like jumped around and uh you know who knows what they shot and maybe that's all they had to work with but i was like oh wow i never would have done that and um but at the time it kind of like worked so you know i i feel like it's an art form that is kind of getting muddled a little bit and what we're teaching is to I I really hate to go down this rabbit hole, but like we're teaching to this whole ADHD YouTube culture of TikTok videos and teaching people only engage the viewer's eyes at this part of the screen. And you're trying to keep people interested for a short period of time. And that's where you get things like these action sequences that have 43 cuts. And obviously that's trying to hide like Liam Neeson being old and stuff in some of these (laughs) movies. But at the same time, it's it is absolutely a style change. And when, when yep. you're looking at those compared to, you know, the early 90s action sequences that hold on a scene for three minutes at a time. My goodness, is that a little bit jarring to, to yep. compare the two of those? <laughs> well, you know, and it, it's not only the action sequences, but it's the dialogue sequences. Yes. Everything is getting cuttier. And, you know, they've talked about that, how the length of time between shots has shortened um, on average because of modern movies. And, you know, you might watch something like especially movies in, let's say, like the 80s or 90s, where, you know, instead of relying on the cut or the edit, they would rely on the camera movement or rely yep. on the acting. And so they would hold the shot longer and you don't see as much of that anymore and so like you know that is a thing for me i I do sometimes wonder if i'm gonna age out because i'm a little bit more like in the classic sense of it of an editor i like to kind of hold things maybe a little bit longer um there were some things in new york ninja that i chose to hold longer maybe even a little too long because that's kind of the style of the time Uh, um but uh 
you know, that I, I think it's just, it, it is kind of changing filmmaking. And so, you know, I, I see editors nowadays, especially like you said, like TikTok videos, things like that. Granted, jump cuts are like, everything's jump cut. You know, you might have somebody talking and there's like, you know, 10 cuts in one sentence just so that they can get it out there. But, um, you know, just editing tricks, you know, digital tricks, all those, you know, the little bag of tricks that people pull from, <laughs> you know, I, that's not really my style. I'm, I like like a classical edit. I like to try to like focus on the, the performance and making it smooth and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I guess everybody has their own style. You know, you like, like a director, you're going to pick a certain editor who works in a certain way, but uh, I, I wonder where it's all going to go. Are things just going to get faster and faster? You know, <laughs> are we going to, am I going to age out of this uh, industry at some point? You know, it's, it's wild to think about because some of these, like New York Ninja, I, I guarantee they didn't have like five cameras of coverage on every shot. They, obviously, they didn't have, they didn't have <laughs> art. <laughs> it was bad enough to get coverage with one camera. There was right. <laughs> very little to work with at times. Yeah. So with some of these, you're looking at the way they film them, and sure, you know, if you're filming on an iPhone, you can have four different crew members filming from different angles, and that feels like nothing. But what are you what are you gaining out of that or really learning if you have so much of the ability to film from every angle yeah well and and that's a big debate nowadays especially so you know back then they shot in film film yeah. was expensive uh, especially if it was a lower budget film so the you know the movie uh you don't want to just run the the film while you're on set you don't it's going right. to burn through your budget so if you had one camera you had to figure out how to shoot things and people would you know, generally shoot for the edit. So you would have in your head already as the director, okay, how can we do this? Or we'll cut from this. So we'll you know, shoot this part, move the camera, shoot this part. You know, it's all, it's all time and money, you know, nowadays. Yeah. They're running digital cameras. You can run them almost all day long, as long as you have yeah. a hard drive that can hold the space. And, you know, it, it's changing the way filmmaking is even done in the first place. You know, I can't say whether it's good or bad. It really all depends upon the project, who the person is, and all that. Yep. But there's a, there's definitely a, a big difference now with the the way things are run on sets. So, well, and you're losing things like storyboarding. It's less important because it, it's easy to change something up and shoot it four different ways and just see what comes out best. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, again, I think there's something to be said for me. Again, I uh, a good friend of mine, Adrian Correa. He's a he's a cinematographer. He just worked on the latest Walking Dead. Um, him and I have been friends for years, and he works with a lot of different directors. And he's said that you can tell who learned on film and who learned on digital because they run the camera differently. And, uh, you know, we'll see if that changes over time. But uh, for myself, learning how to shoot film, I if if I'm going out to shoot something, I'm almost always going to pre edit in my head and try to shoot as close as possible to the edit. Now, sometimes you get into the editing room and you realize, oh, uh, I should have actually gotten some more coverage than I did. <laughs> and you got to figure out how to fix it. But uh, but yeah, I think it, it changes the way filmmakers think and I, I think it's important to even if you're shooting digital plan your edit ahead of time because i think it'll change you as a director and you'll you know you might uh make an interesting choice to hold a scene from like one angle you know whereas if you're running four cameras you're like okay well, we'll just get the coverage and we'll figure it out in the edit sure and then you might just decide to keep it from one camera but i think when you make that choice on set it feels more organic and it feels like that's how it was meant to be shot. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good call. Um, yeah. Your your film background itself. What what have you always been a fan of? What, what are you What are you looking to to watch when you're in your own free time? Oh man, I watch everything. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean. I was raised on horror movies and action movies. I've always been a genre fan. I mean, I, I will watch anything, but. Uh, action or horror i mean i see every horror movie that basically comes out uh in the theater at least you know on shutter or whatever it's hard to keep up with everything that comes yeah. out now uh but you know I, i'll pretty much go to the theater to see any horror movie um i just love them so as someone who's worked in low budget horror how do you feel about horror in 2024 because obviously there's there's a lot of talk over the last couple of years about what's been good, what's been bad. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 
we're definitely in the age of uh, like horror films having a message. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of that. Now, I get that the the industry has always had that. I mean, you you know, yeah. everybody talks about like how Romero's films were social commentaries and all that. But I think the difference is the film came first, the social commentary came second. I think there's yeah. a lot of films that are being made now where the social commentary is first and then the film is second. That's not particularly my cup of tea. Um, so we'll see how things you know uh, the horror genre changes with the decades so you know we're definitely in a very obviously political decade and there's a lot of social commentary and all that so um not my favorite uh if i'll be honest i <laughs> i've found myself just especially in this job you know i work we work on older horror films and yeah. i just found myself recently going back and just watching older stuff more and more you know because uh i miss the escapism you know, and that's one of the best things about the horror uh, genre is the escapism. So, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll kind of see. We'll see what's next. You know, <laughs> you know, we went through the we went through the found footage era. We went through the, the like the J horror era. You know, there's always another trend with horror films. Um, but what I like about that, even it though they can be like trendy and you know once you see one of a certain style you'll see a bunch of them but i, I think the creativity that comes out of that is is kind of interesting so um you never know where you know who's going to make what next that's just going to kind of turn the genre so any from the last couple of years that have struck you as particularly creative that you've appreciated Ooh, ha uh, probably but off the top of my head <laughs> that's that's a little tough um last couple of years i don't know yeah, it's putting me on the spot. I'd have to think. Totally about that. understand it. Yeah. Um, with with editing, uh, is there is there any certain thing that you feel like is is your calling card? Because I know for a lot of editors, there's a lot of things that they go, "Yeah, I do this a lot." <laughs> um, no, I, I I don't know. It's it's tough. I don't know what my calling card would be. I'd have to, uh, you know, because like as a filmmaker, most of the time you don't like your own movies. Um, I think it's rare yeah. when you do. You have to get away from them and see them years later. So, like, right now, I think about the stuff that I've made, and I'm not a huge fan of it. I mean, I am proud of some of the things on New York Ninja. I'm proud of how I was able to make some of the scenes work. I mean, sometimes I have very yeah. little to work with and, you know, to make those work. But I think, like, editors are kind of the unsung heroes because you don't know what they had to work with. Right. So, you know, you, you, you might if you're an editor and you had a director that shot a ton of footage with all different cameras and all this other kind of stuff, you have a mess of stuff that you have to work with. You have to file it down to the most important, but you have all that coverage to work with. Then you have the editors that may, it might've been a one camera shoot and now they have very little coverage and they got to figure out how to make that scene work. So, you know, without knowing the, 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 um, raw material that people had to work with. I think it is kind of hard to gauge whether something is a good edit. And it's like, w what's better? The guy who takes a million shots and narrows them down to, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, one cohesive scene or somebody who had very little and made a really good right. scene. It, I don't know. It's hard to tell. So, yeah. It's a good philosophical question. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh Gosh, one thing that I do want to say then is one thing that people don't seem to look at editing as, uh, I don't even know how to explain this, like as, as one of the skills of it. But with New York Ninja, there's a really unique way to answer this question, I think. How do you know when the project is done? Because you could have kept editing New York Ninja forever, literally. Yeah, that is a very difficult thing. Um <sighs> What's the saying? Like, uh, perfection is the enemy of good or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, you know, I've always just had a timetable when I want to get things out and get them done. And so I, I just stay focused on that timetable. Sometimes it's my own created timetable, but usually it's something like a festival or something along those lines where it's like, you kind of got to get it done for that time. Um, and I think having that deadline works. So I would say if, if you are like a low budget filmmaker or any kind of filmmaker, but it, whether or not you're directing, editing, whatever you're doing, I would give yourself that timeline and you just have to call it at some point. You're always going to find problems with it later on. But you know what? That's, if it's not out there for people to see, well, what good does it do? You know? And I run into that with creative people a lot. Is like they keep tinkering and they keep playing with things. And it's like sometimes you just have to call it and say, you know what? I'm going to put it out and see what happens. So. 
what is the the hardest part of your day to day job restoring these films? Oh uh, man, um, it sometimes like I don't want to say it can be monotonous, but it, it can. When you're sitting at a computer screen for hours on end, cleaning up little bits of dirt and dust, um, it can be a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, the one good thing is that because Vinegar Syndrome, we put out four movies a month at least yep. sometimes more when we're doing box sets and during our sales and all that when you're doing four movies a month you're always moving on to another movie so at least you're looking at something new and again when we get to discover a film that we haven't seen before that's always exciting um but it doesn't change the fact when you're just sitting at the computer for you know eight hours a day sometimes just cleaning up dirt and dust and scratches uh it can be a little monotonous but one of the good things is we go at each restoration because it's a very small crew here. So we do a little bit of everything. The restoration guys, we do the restoration. Um, we do the QC, we do like the sound cleanup, all that kind of stuff. So we're all kind of working on these, these projects in various different ways. So it's almost like, one week might be like a really heavy restoration week. And then by the end of the week, you're just like your eyeballs are burnt on the restoration. But then next week you're doing, you know, audio restoration or something. And then, then your ears are burnt and you're like, Oh crap, I want to get back to restoration. So, you know, that is the one good thing. Uh, we are jumping around a lot, but yeah, I would say that they, they can get monotonous at times. Uh, I don't think we've ever heard publicly like any details on the vinegar syndrome QC side. Uh, I, I know from working with other people, how just intense some of these are like some of these movies get watched like 32 times just to look literally scene by scene. Can you share what the VS QC process is like? Cause not to name other b boutiques necessarily, but it, it's not like VS is having problems every month. So you must be pretty good at it. I mean, we try again, we, we have a small crew, but we're, we're a good crew. And I think, you know, I don't know how other people run the, their, uh, you know, QC, but the one good thing is like the, the guys that are doing the restorations are the ones doing the QC. So we kind of know what to look for. Um, right. We know the problems, we know the trouble spots. So we're not just like passively watching the films, um, but it goes, we try to go through multiple levels of QC. So there's QC uh, that we do on like, uh, you know, we do the restoration, then we do a digital QC, you know, like on a computer, like a digital file. And then we do, we fix whatever problems we find in there. And then it goes to a disc and the disc gets watched multiple times. And so we, we try to have redundancy in that so that, you know, we try to catch as much as possible. You know, nobody's perfect. Obviously we've done replacement discs. Um, right. things, things happen, things happen in, in, um, replication. You know, sometimes we, we do the best we can and it, it's good for us. And then it goes to replication. And when it gets put on that disc, somebody there makes a mistake and, you know, and then we don't discover it till it gets, uh, gets into the doors and then you know there's there's only so much we can do about it at that point so right. you know mistakes get made but it, it's really just i think one the redundancy and two having people that know the things to look for um and that's just something you learn unfortunately by finding the mistakes you know uh compression issues things like that yeah. You know, not everybody has the eye for that. And I think, you know, again, it's not something you can really train for, but the more you do it, the more your eye gets trained for it. So, yeah, I, I think that talking to other people, that's one thing that I've noticed is people don't understand that literally when you're talking about QC, we're, we're talking 100 percent focus. You can't look away for a split second. A single frame could cause a massive fuck up. And you're like, I, I don't want to be the, you know, the, the the person that missed this and then it's all over the forums for the next six months the vs is a failure or something so yeah. it's such a it's a high pressure thing to to be able to pay attention for the next 94 minutes yeah well when people say like oh you get to watch movies for your job that must be great and i'm like it's not i it's not <laughs> qc is like the worst because like here's the thing is by the time we're sitting there watching the movie we've already watched it a lot you know, right. it, it's never the first time we're seeing it. And then you, like you said, you have to stay focused. And if you don't, and you miss something and like, we've all been the person that's missed something. I mean, even, even if we catch it and fix it, just the fact that we have to hit the brakes and go back and right. the author or fix whatever the problem is, you know, I mean, we, you know, we have bosses and we have people that we work with. And when we make mistakes, you know, you, you hear about it and you don't want to be the one that makes the mistake. I mean, there's times I've lost sleep 
you know, where, you know, we're, we're on a tight deadline. All of a sudden there's a mistake and it's like, Oh, that was my fault. I missed that, you know? And then, um, you know, you have trouble sleeping that night and you're like, damn, I should have been, you know, and then you fix it and you move on and you try not to make that mistake again. So, uh, it's all, you know, trial by fire, unfortunately, you know, uh, you, you have so many different parts of this process that you play a fairly large part in. And again, another thing I don't think we've heard publicly talked about for anybody that doesn't know the whole process. Could you take us through a film comes into vinegar syndrome and it's going to be released on, on 4k, what is the entire process? Uh, yeah. So the, the, I mean, first we have to get the rights. That's step number one, uh, which, which isn't a small part, <laughs> which is sometimes the hardest part, you know, right. everybody has asked, Oh, how do you choose which movies? It's, there's a multitude of ways that, you know, things come to us. We go after certain things. We try to find producers. We have, you know, studio deals, all that kind of stuff, but we get the rights. We get the materials, uh, the materials come into our building. If, if sometimes certain foreign films, things in Europe, they won't let them out of the country. And then we have to have scans done overseas or whatever, but we try to avoid that as much as possible because again, uh, we have very good people here. Brandon Upson, for example, I will mention him as much as possible because he's been with the company from the very beginning. He's our like resident scanner for the most part, and he is meticulous and the scanning goes a long way. So the film comes in, it gets cleaned, it gets prepped, um, any kind of physical damage that needs to be repaired, we try to repair it. Uh, Oscar, Oscar Besher, who you talk to, he's hands-on with that too, with the cleaning, um, fixing splices, that kind of thing. But there's the physical you know, restoration that we do in terms of cleaning it and getting it ready, then it is digitally scanned. And again, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made in that stage. And, um, I think that's where a lot of companies unfortunately make their mistakes is in the scanning. Um, but the scanning gets done. Uh, then we get a digital output and it's usually, we get each individual reel and then, uh, it goes into one of the programs to get cleaned up. Uh, so then we go through, we remove the dirt, the dust, all that kind of stuff. Uh, after that, it usually goes to color and, while it's in color, uh, somebody, generally myself, will work on sound sync. So you, because the sound is separate. So it's like if we have reels one through five of picture, we'll have reels one through five of sound. Now, in theory, those should sync up. <laughs> that is not always the case. There's a lot of reasons why that stuff doesn't always yep. work. Um, and again, if there's different sources and we have to edit that stuff together, um, but then we basically create one version of the film that's, you know, picture and sound, sync, lock, color, all that kind of stuff that gets exported out. Sometimes it'll go through another restoration process after that. Um, if we think it needs one, then it'll go through its first QC which is to try to find any picture errors that might have been introduced or missed or anything like that. Sound, if there's like pops, clicks, things of that nature that we, we can repair, then it'll come back out of Q, uh, the like first initial QC. We'll fix whatever fixes we can. At that point, if we think we're good, we'll call it. It then has to be authored and then put on discs. Uh, we do that in-house. We do our own temporary discs. We then take it into QC and they're watched multiple times. We have, you know, certain stages of QC that we go through. And then once it passes all of those, you know, if there's a problem, we got to hit the brakes. We got to go back and start again. Um, but once it goes through all the stages of QC and it's approved from everybody, we sign off on it and then it's sent to replication. And then uh, we wait about however many weeks or months, depending upon replication, to get it back. And uh, then it goes out to the customer. Jeez. Yeah, that's uh, th that's just a, a small, <laughs> small yeah. undertaking for some of these films. And yet. And again, we're doing that with like at least four films a month. You know, it's not like we're doing that with one film. You know, right. it's not like we're taking a year to work on one film. You know, um, so it's a lot and, you know, uh, you have to be good at what you do. You have to be fast and you have to be on, you know, so I give a lot of credit to the guys that work here. 
Uh, you mentioned other companies might make errors during the scanning process. What, what is some evidence of that? What's something that we could see on some of these? Um, scanner lines. Uh, it's something that the average person won't notice, um, but it's a thing that can change whether or not we do Blu-ray versus uh, UHD. Um, mm. Because if if uh, it's not scanned properly or it's scanned on a lesser quality scanner. Uh, you can kind of see these like faint lines that are like baked into the image and there's really nothing you can do about that. Also, uh, on a lesser scanner, um, you can, uh, it can introduce more dirt and more problems that need to be fixed later on and stability. If it's not a good scanner, the film might not go through as stable and then you get a lot like um, people don't clean their scanners. Like we meticulously clean our scanners here. Uh, so if somebody isn't cleaning their scanners, it can introduce a lot more problems that have to be fixed. And now, you know, a lot of them are fixable, not all of them, but a lot of them are, but it just creates more time and, and effort. So, right. um, you know, it, that's what it's like with this entire job is like doing a good job at, this phase so that the next phase goes smoothly you know and <laughs> trust me you get too far down the the, the road and you're like oh crap now we got to go back and right. no, nobody ever wants to go back so yeah that that go back is uh that's the last resort it yeah. seems like for many yeah. of these cases um like i said it's the week of the halfway to black friday sale and other than a blade in the dark navy seals what is the the Curtis mixtape? If somebody wanted to say, "Man, I, I want the greatest hits," wh what should they pick up this week? Uh, I mean, definitely Sudden Fury because I will always champion that one. It's one of our older releases, but it does not get a lot of love. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of like a Canadian uh, Coen Brothers film. Um, it's uh, like kind of a thriller. It's pretty bleak. I I enjoy it. Um, I'm a big fan of Miami Connection. Uh, New York Ninja played on a lot of double features with Miami Connection. Um, if you've never seen that, it's like a fun martial arts film. Uh, love it. I absolutely love it. It's got a great soundtrack, great score. Uh, so definitely Miami Connection, uh, Sudden Fury, um, Death Promise. If you've seen, God, I love Death Promise. If you've seen New York Ninja and you've liked and you like that, check out Death Promise because it's it's similar. It's kind of a little bit closer to what New York Ninja probably would have been or what I wanted it to be. Like I tried yeah. to use that as an inspiration to uh, you know because to be honest, if New York Ninja came out when it did in the eighties, it probably would have been an absolute mess. If I'm being a hundred percent honest, but. <laughs> um, but it's it's close in in tone and theme, and that's kind of what I tried to go for. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, Candy Snatchers. That's another one that I think goes overlooked sometimes. It's another sort of bleak film. If you like Sudden Fury, yeah. I think check out Candy Snatchers. It was one that I was very excited that we were putting out at the time, and um, I don't think it's really gotten the love that it deserved. So. Not at all. Uh, Candy Snatchers is definitely another one. Um, just trying to think. It's, it's hard to think. There's so many movies. You know, I'm going to look at our list later and be like, ah, I should have said that one. You well, know? and Sudden Fury is out of print, by the way. So people can't even pick that up. Oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> that shows Candy, what I, okay, we'll Candy go. Snatchers yeah. is, uh, is one of those ones that uh, you watch the movie and you go, damn, I love that. And then you watch the special features and the director's sitting there going, why do people care about this movie? Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of directors that kind of like look at their films and are like, ah, I don't, why, why does everybody, why does anybody care about this? And it's like, yeah. we care. Like, it, you know, trust us, we care. Um, well, yeah, you know, I didn't realize some fear was, shows us what I know. I mean, we have so many, <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to think of what else, uh, writing wrongs. If you haven't seen Writing Wrongs, um, we're big fans of Cynthia Rothrock here. Oh, yeah. Um, we love her movies, and we've done as much as we can to get as many of them out as possible. Uh, if you're new to Hong Kong martial arts films, I would recommend uh, Writing Wrongs to start with. Uh, if you're not, and you've seen a bunch of them, and you haven't seen Writing Wrongs, I recommend it. The fight scenes are great. Uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting not to get too deep on the Hong Kong films, but a lot of them, there's usually multiple cuts. So yeah. a lot of our martial arts films, we have to present multiple cuts because they played in different countries or like mainly in China versus Hong Kong. Um, but what's really interesting about 
writing wrongs is that they're drastically different in the tone and the endings. So uh, I think it kind of gives you an idea of like, this is back to the restoration side of things. We have to make sure we get the multiple cuts and try to present the, the versions of the film that have been out there and all of those have their own QC and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of work went into writing wrongs. That was one of our earlier Hong Kong projects. So uh, I'm, I'm particularly fond of that one. And then obviously if you're going for a Curtis greatest hits, so you got to pick up New York. Ninja New York Ninja. Yes. Um, Curtis, this has been astonishing. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time to talk about all this. There's so much that people are kind of hungry to know about. And I feel like vinegar syndrome is one of those companies. Obviously there's a lot of moving parts, but the cool thing is most of the people involved are allowed to, to talk about it and, and have a persona per se. And yeah. I think nowadays, especially for this industry, that's kind of what is leading to people wanting to buy from some of these companies. You, there are some random boutiques that you've never heard from them. You don't know why they put these movies out. You, you know, you don't get to hear their restoration artists saying that they love Navy SEALs. So why would they buy their releases? It's not, right. it's not the same sort of thing. Yeah, no, we, we are, we are 100% passionate about the films. Uh, not just these films, films in general, but like right. these films, like we are, we are usually pretty big champions of the films that we release. Um, but we're, we are all 100% movie people here. I mean, trust me when I say it's pretty much all we talk about all day. So <laughs> we're working on movies while talking about movies. And then we go home and we watch movies and then we come back in and we talk about those movies. So that's, you know, we're, we are definitely film fans here and uh, there are real people working on these things. And, um, you know, I just also have to give a shout out to our shipping department because they are the unsung heroes, you know, they don't get to do the podcasts and the interviews right. and stuff like that. So, uh, but they work hard down there and there are real people shipping out real packages and there's a lot of them. And, uh, you know, in our sales, we get slammed and they work very hard and they work long hours. And let me tell you, I've done it and packing boxes is not fun. So, uh, shout out to our shipping department. So, one of these days, I got to get Evie on the show. I think <laughs> she's she would have a whole different perspective of. Well, you know, it's. I listen. I love our customers. I love everybody that supports us. Um, but you know, sometimes customer service can be difficult. And uh, you know, I just to say the least to anybody listening to this. Just be patient. You'll get your package. We love all of our customers. We want to do right by you guys. Uh, just you know, just know that there are real people with real lives and we are, you know, working hard to get your packages out. We are not an Amazon. We are not, you know, some big company. We don't have a, another fulfillment center right. like our, you know, I can go downstairs right now into the shipping department and go say hi to everybody. You know, it's, it's, it, we're like a tight knit family around here and um, I, they are the unsung heroes of this company. So. Wow. Well said. Uh, thanks again, Curtis. Everybody go support Vinegar Syndrome during the Halfway to Black Friday sale. Uh, congrats on New York Ninja again, and uh, thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hello, this is Chris Haskell from They Live by Film. Um, for those that don't know us, Adam, Zach, and I, we built a podcast over the last two years that's a combination of film discussion from three very different perspectives, as well as industry interviews with the leaders in Boutique Blu-ray and 4K community. We started with Dev Crocodile, but over time we've been lucky enough to speak with Arrow Video, Severin, Mondo Macabro, Vinegar Syndrome, Radiance, Indicator, most of the OCN partner labels. It's been a blast. You can find us wherever you podcast, and also actually recently as part of someone's favorite production podcast network. We hope to see you online. Thank you for listening to the Disconnected Podcast. There's one big thing that you could do to help the show, and that is to leave a rating and review on the podcast service of your choice. Thank you.